Hello, um, thank you for having me. It's such an absolute honor to be here today. Um, and the topic of my presentation today is how to sleep better at night and survive on call with robust automations. And we're essentially going to be speaking about how you can take uh, DevOps philosophy and you can apply the same principles that we use with infrastructure as code to how we handle others. But before I get started, I wanna very briefly just give some more background about myself. So I've been a developer for more than 15 years. Uh, that's and that's of open source involved. Um, also live cybersecurity professionally in recent years. And um, I also have been blogging for about as long. Recently, I've started creating YouTube content. And uh, for the past recent years, almost everything I do has been around Kubernetes at Kubernetes startups, uh, both as a developer and in customer facing roles and today as co-founder of Robusta. Okay, so I'm going to talk about three topics. Um, the first topic is the history of automation and uh, specifically the history of DevOps automation. Second topic, I'm going to explain why you should automate alerts the same way that we automate everything else in DevOps. And third, I'm going to be speaking specifically about Robusta and about Kubernetes automation, automating alerts on, Kuber on Kubernetes. So I want to start off with a trip to the past. I want to go back 15 years to how I developed software when I got started. And I got started and I started working on some WordPress websites and I did some Python code and web applications uh, in Django. And when I got started, then essentially there were a few different stages to how you develop software. First, you built software and I would check out code locally. I would uh, make my changes and I would build it locally. I would run some tests locally. And um, if everything worked, then I would go on to the next stage and that's the deploy stage. So I would upload files onto a virtual host, upload them with FTP, I would run app get install, install a bunch of dependencies, move files into the right place. Now I've deployed my web application. Next step, I had to configure it. So I would go into a web console. I would set up some DNS records. If I deploy a new version of the application, maybe I would stop the old one and start the new one. Um, I would configure stuff manually. Um, maybe I would configure some rules for Apache or for Nginx, uh, set stuff up. Um, next stage, so I did everything well. I like was really excited. I took my application, put it online, messaged all my friends on uh, IRC, um, put a post on Hacker News, and it really blew up. And now everyone is coming to the website, and now I have a problem because now there's that load on my server. So I add another server, deploy another copy. Essentially, I go here and I do that deploy and configure stage from scratch. And now I have another copy of my application running. Um, lastly, something is going wrong. Something isn't working right. So um, if I'm lucky, I have some monitoring in place, and I see that there's an issue. And now it's time to respond to that and to fix the issue. So um, I respond to that. I connect to the server over SSH, start to investigate what's going on. I run PS. I uh, try and fix the issue, and I fix the issue manually. And every, almost every single part of this has changed in the past 15 years, and it's gone a fundamental shift. And in each case, what we do today is totally, totally different than what we did back when I got started. So I want to show that. What we did is we essentially went through each and every one of these stages and we automated them. So for build, I'm no longer just building code locally and then running tests on my local machine. We have CI CD, like Jenkins, like GitHub Actions, um, like Circle CI. And essentially my code every single night or after every single commit, it's being built, we're running tests, we're doing all that automatically. So I can't accidentally like go right ahead to the deploy stage without running tests or when something isn't building. Like it just, I wouldn't be able to get there because we have an automated platform and this build stage is now automated. Moving on to the next stage. So I don't deploy files. I don't deploy my application the way that I used to. Used to be you had to upload files with FTP, install your dependencies, run app, get install, do something different if it's a CentOS host and if it's a Ubuntu host, if it's a Debian host. And all that had issues because you were really dependent on the machine that you were running on. Some machines would have different dependencies, different versions of the software you need. Maybe you're deploying a PHP application and there's PHP um, 5 on one and PHP 4 in another. Um, don't catch me on the versions. I haven't done PHP in a very long time. Um, it, but the point is that when you deploy this software, um, we no longer deploy that same way. We deploy with containers. And essentially what I've done is I, by automating this and by using Docker, I've shifted like this entire deploy phase. I've shifted a big part of that to build time. Now I have a Docker file, I build this container, that container is self-contained, has everything I want inside of it. And when it comes time to deploy, I just take that container, put it somewhere else. I'm not dependent on uh, the local machine. It doesn't matter what the dependencies are on the local machine, as long as it has Docker. And my container there is self-contained, it has everything in it. Um, every time I commit and I do a build in the build stage, then that builds my Docker container as well. And deploying is just so much easier. 
I take a Docker container, um, get it running there um, on the right machine. So very easy. And this has all been automated with Docker. Now, moving on to the configure stage, then we also no longer do this. I no longer go and just set up records or configure stuff manually. We have infrastructure as code, whether it's uh, Kubernetes and YAML manifests, or if it's the underlying infrastructure and stuff like Terraform, I run kubectl apply the instructions for everything what I used to do as a person, it's now contained in the YAML file um, or in the Terraform file. Uh, this is exactly how to set stuff up. And I just apply that file and everything happens. So there's no longer a manual stage here. Um, moving on to scale, then of course we do auto scaling, HPA, VPA, horizontal uh, pod auto scaler, vertical pod auto scaler, even auto scaling groups uh, with AWS if you're not using Kubernetes. And the scale phase is also totally, totally automated. Um, and that's no longer something that we do manually. So if we look at each of these first four stages, then we used to do stuff really manually, or we would automate it, but we would automate with these in-house solutions, these ad hoc solutions that each company invented for themselves. And today, for each one of those, we have a platform. We have a really great piece of open source technology that lets us take that and lets us do it automatically and give us all these extra features, and it's a whole lot more robust. But if I move on to the last stage, then the last stage, in many ways, is still left behind. When alerts occur and when we respond to those alerts and we go and we investigate them, very often we are still connecting over SSH or running kubectl exec. Um, we're still investigating stuff similar to the way we investigated in the past. And that's the area that with the Robusta open source project, we're trying to really automate and bring into the modern day. OK, so moving on, there are a few common themes in all the types of automation that we spoke about in the previous slide, from the build phase to the deploy phase to the configure phase, to the scale phase, also to what we're doing with Robusta. There's a common theme here in all of them, two common themes. First, everything has become configuration files. Those configuration files are often YAML. And they have high-level instructions. What I mean by this is back in the day, like if you wanted to automate the build, then you had some ad hoc in-house solution, and you would run a bunch of scripts. Um, maybe you check something out. You do dot slash uh, autoconf, dot slash configure, and you run a bunch of stuff. And then you have a script that wraps that. And um, you have all these scripts that you write, you no longer do that. You're just writing a YAML file. That YAML file, sure, it has some scripts in it and it has some stuff contained in it. Um, it sorry, in that Docker file, uh, for example, when you're defining how to build it, um, if you're building on GitHub uh, actions, then there's a YAML file there that defines all the stages. So we still have some of those same scripts, but they're wrapped in this configuration file with high-level instructions. And it's not just an ad hoc script. And the reason that these configuration files are important is because then it's running on an underlying engine that adds all these extra features for us. For example, if a GitHub action fails, then I automatically have the logs and I can see exactly where it's, it failed and I see that in the GitHub uh, user interface. If um, I'm using a Docker file instead of like an ad hoc solution for packaging stuff, now there's caching. Each layer builds upon the previous layer. I benefit from Docker uh, layer caching. So by moving to these automated platforms, we suddenly get all these extra features. And as a user, it's a whole lot easier. I can write a short config file, often in YAML, and I get stuff that previously I would have had to write a whole lot of code for that. Maybe the best example of that is auto scaling. If I look at auto scaling, then I'm just putting in there like one line in a YAML file or like one short YAML file defining how to auto scale stuff. And now if something uh, dies, it'll get brought back up. I mean, that's the self healing aspect, not the auto scaling. But if I change the number in there, or if the CPU load changes, um, then suddenly stuff will auto scale. And I'm not, I don't have to write all this code or all these scripts that then like say if this and then that and do this. I'm just saying what I want, what I want to happen. And the underlying engine, Kubernetes, will handle all the implementation details. So by giving a configuration file, I can work at a much, much higher level. And there are, there are huge benefits to that. And the second part of this, which is equally important, is when I have a configuration file, I can take that file and I can stick it in Git. And the big shift that happened here. For each of these uh, phases, the big shift that happened is there used to be knowledge that was inside my head, and that became machine knowledge. So if I look at building stuff, I used to go to a wiki page, and I would read, like, how do I build this software? And then we run a bunch of commands. That no longer happens. That knowledge for how to do it, it's automated. It happens every time I push a commit. It happens on GitHub Actions. Um, if I want to deploy my software, if I create a new version of it, then I don't have to go and like, run a bunch of commands um, it would do something. It's just a Docker file, and Docker is doing it for me. So essentially, in each of these stages that we speak about, the knowledge that used to be like knowledge that was inside my own head, it has become knowledge in a Git repository. And that means I can audit that knowledge. Um, I can share it with my team. If I leave the company, the knowledge is still there. So essentially, the two big themes here for what 
we benefit from for automation is first by having these configuration files, then we get all these this extra high level functionality without writing a lot of complicated code. And second of all, by having these automation engines, we can take a workflow that was previously a human workflow and it's now a config file in Git. And therefore knowledge has gone out of my head and it's become a file in Git, it's become machine knowledge that the machine can do for me. Okay, so moving on, then I wanna speak now about how we can apply this to the area of responding to others. And essentially the concept here is can we take these same concepts, these same automation principles, and can we apply it to on-call? Can we apply it to how we handle alerts? Now, alerting itself and the system for defining alerts, that's all very well known how to do. Uh, there's great technology out there. So you're probably already using Prometheus or Datadog or Dynatrace or AppDynamics or some other system or New Relic. So they're great alerting systems. Um, it, personally, I love Prometheus and Alert Manager. They're great systems to define the alerts. But what happens when those alerts fire? Someone still has to go and investigate that. So can we really try and automate that process of taking the alert and then understanding what it means, understanding how we fix it, and maybe even fixing it automatically. And what we like to achieve are really three things that we've achieved in each of the previous examples for automation. One, we want to make it all work faster. We want to have a faster response to alerts. Um, I was speaking to a company recently in, um, I believe, in England, and they said to me, um, our on-call um, our on-call team has to respond within um, three minutes, because that's the maximum downtime that we're allowed um, in an entire month. That's the SLA that we promise customers. So in a lot of uh, major companies and live um, teams, you really have to respond fast. And therefore, having some automation is really important if you want to meet that SLA, that, um, that SLA agreement that you have with your customers. Two, now that sharing, just like by um, taking stuff and putting it in a Docker file, or by putting in GitHub Action, um, it, or even by using um, a configure infrastructure as code and by using YAML files, you can kind of share the knowledge um, and take knowledge that was previously in your head, like instructions, how do I set a server up? And now it's just the Terraform plan. Now you just apply that file. Um, so can we take the knowledge that's inside your head for how you respond to alerts? And can we just make that another file and get? And lastly, uh, we want to respond to alerts better than we do today. And if you look at all the previous examples of automation, then obviously GitHub Actions is way better than just having like an in-house solution to try and some scripts that you write because there's a platform and it's open source and lots of features and they add on features and you benefit from those features. So can we do the same thing for their response? And can we really respond to their better by automating the way we do it? Okay, so I'm going to look at three pieces of open source technology that you can use to do this. I'm going to speak most about Robusta, the last one, which I work on personally. But I want to mention the other ones because they're also great pieces of technology and they're all open source. So first is Stackstorm. Stackstorm is uh, the oldest technology here. So it's very mature and it's used to automate um, the response and to automate other stuff, to automate other workflows and do automatic remediations. Um, and Stackflow, um, the advantage and the disadvantage is that it's not Kubernetes native. So it will work on everything, but it's not specifically built for Kubernetes. Moving on to the next one, Argo Events. Argo Events absolutely is built for Kubernetes and it's a great piece of technology. Um, and the advantage and disadvantage of Argo Events is that the way Argo works is everything is just a pod or a container or a Kubernetes resource. So with Argo, you can say when something happens, then go and automate this by running a Docker, by running a pod, by running this container. Um, but then you have to supply the details for why is that container. And moving on to Robusta, um, the advantage and the disadvantage of Robusta is that we're really specific and we're really focused specifically on responding to alerts and remediating them. And we have like domain specific knowledge about specific alerts. So we're a little more specific. We're not a general purpose framework like the others, but for the use case of responding to alerts, we've tried to really build it dedicated on that use case. But all three of these are great pieces of technology. Um, and the Robusta philosophy really is three things. One, Kubernetes native. So it's built specifically for Kubernetes. It can work elsewhere, but the focus is on Kubernetes. Two, all batteries included. So when you install Robusta, it should just work out of the box. Um, if you send it your Prometheus alerts, then you should get value even before you go and configure anything. So we have built-in knowledge about common alerts. And three, it should be easy to use. Um, we're trying to save you time. We're trying to help you automate stuff. So if you have to invest a lot of time and effort in that, then it's really not worth it for you. And there are three core concepts in terms of how Robusta works under the hood. Triggers, actions, and syncs. Now, conceptually, a trigger is something that occurs in your Kubernetes cluster or outside of it 
that triggers a reaction that kicks off this automated workflow. So an example trigger would be um, a Prometheus alert fired and there's an alert going on, there's something wrong with your cluster that triggers a workflow. Moving on to the next part, an action is what you do when that trigger fires. So an action can gather extra information. You can take that other and you can investigate why it happened. Um, an action can also fix stuff. You can say, okay, I know what this problem is. It's a known trigger. So I'm going to go and automatically apply a fix. Um, and there are many different types of actions. And that's the async, that's the destination. That's where you get the data, where it's sent to you, um, where you get a notification about that. Um, so that could be a Slack channel, for example. And I'll give some examples now um, of really each of these different concepts. So triggers would be Prometheus alerts, Kubernetes changes, anything that happens in your cluster. Um, for example, if a new deployment was rolled out, um, and it can also be manual triggers. Like you say, okay, right now, I want to trigger an automated workflow. Um, but there are many, many more triggers. I'm just giving three examples here. An action, again, we have something like 70 actions built in and you can add on your own. But actions could be go and run a profiler, uh, get a memory dump, fetch the logs for me, go fetch a graph from Grafana and send it to me. Um, and there are many, many more actions. And moving on to sync, so we support Slack, uh, MS Teams, Apps Genie, uh, Telegram, you can send stuff to a webhook, you can send stuff to Kafka topic, lots and lots of different syncs. And if you need something that doesn't exist, then just open an issue on GitHub and we'll get around to it very fast and add it on for you. And the last comment that I want to say about the architecture is everything is strongly typed. So like if you have an alert, let's you have a trigger with a Prometheus alert um, that kicks off an automated workflow, then we know in the robust system, we have metadata about that. And we know like this trigger is an alert about a pot, or this is a alert about a node, or this is a trigger that occurred because you rolled out a new Kubernetes deployment. And we have data about what triggered that automated workflow. And that data passes to the next phase. And this is really, really important because it means, let's say you had um, a trigger that was a Prometheus alert. And that alert is that the node is running out of disk space. So we know that this trigger, this um, alert that's firing, it's about a specific node. So when that passes on to the action, then you can have actions like go fetch a graph of um, the disk usage. And the action will automatically know how to take the right node from the trigger and what Kubernetes object it should apply that action to. Or if you have a Prometheus alert that certain pod is crashing, then that's the trigger and that passes to the action and the action receives that specific Kubernetes pod. So you can then have an action like go fetch the logs and the action will know which pod it should fetch the logs from. Um, and then from the action, that same type data passes on to the sync and that lets you do cool stuff. Like you, you can say if there's an alert on a specific namespace and then send it to a specific Slack channel where the right developers are located. And you can do smart routing there because you know all that metadata about what the Kubernetes object is that was involved um, in this trigger that went to the action that eventually got to the sync. Now, I want to give a specific example because I've really spoken about the architecture in high level. So here's one concrete example. Um, you had a crashing pod in your cluster and the automation here and the automated response is one that's very simple go fetch the dogs and tell me the dog so I can see why it crashed. And essentially, um, this is like the world's simplest example of automating your alert response. Before this, you would get a message in Slack that says like, oh, a pod crashed. And then you would go and run kubectl dogs yourself and you would fetch the dogs. And now we're just automating that process. So we're taking one step out of it instead of getting a message in Slack that says like your pod crashed. And then you go manually and you fetch the dogs. The logs are fetched automatically for you. And then you get a message in Slack that has like some extra information. So you no longer need to open up the command line, connect to the cluster, and then fetch the logs. All the data is right there in the, in the alert itself. This is a really simple example, uh, but it's one that I think is good to demonstrate uh, the general concept. OK, so um, I see it. I'm going to just pause for a moment. I see there's a question already. Um, in the channel. Um, it, so someone has asked, can you please share which tool has been used for the slides? Um, and the answer is I've been using uh, Canva. So Canva is um, an excellent piece of software and um, it's a SaaS platform and I have the paid version on that. Um, and I use that to create the slides. Um, so that's why I used to create these. Um, and if there are other questions, I'm going to answer more questions later on, but please, I love it when people ask questions. Um, I love audience participation. Uh, makes me feel a whole lot better as a speaker. So please feel free to write your questions in the chat. 
OK, moving on. So we saw one specific example here of an automated workflow. And now I want to show really how this automated workflow was written behind the scenes and how it actually works. Like if you want to configure a workflow like this, where every time a pod crashes, then you get a message in Slack with um, the dogs for the crashing pod, then how would you actually go and configure that? So it's really easy, just the YAML. So here I have those three parts that I mentioned earlier, triggers, actions, and syncs. The trigger is a Prometheus alert called QPod crash looping. And if you don't have a Prometheus alert like that, don't worry. Like when you install Robust, I can give you all those default alerts. Um, two, the action is logs enricher. We're going to take this alert and we're going to enrich it with the logs. And you might be thinking the logs of which pod. Well, it's the logs of the pod that crashed over here. We get the data from the alert and then automatically the actions will run on the relevant pod. And then the destination we're sending it to is Slack. And there are a whole lot more stuff you can do here. By default, for example, this is rate limited. So if like the same deployment is crashing, you have like a thousand pods, you're only gonna get one notification for every, for every 60 minutes or you can configure stuff like that. So there actually are a whole lot more options here, but this is the general concept. Moving on, I'm gonna show a few more examples and I'm gonna give examples from different categories. Um, the first category that I'm going to give here um, is I'm going to show um, how you can investigate known alerts. So when you install Robusta, I said batteries included. So out of the box, we include in Robusta remediations and investigations and automated workflows for your common alerts. So you just send, you add on to Prometheus one webhook, the stuff gets to Robusta. You can continue getting your old alerts and you can send the Robusta alerts to a new Slack channel. And now your alerts, if they're in our library of known alerts, they will come with extra information. So the first example of that is CPU throttling high. So you add high CPU throttling, that's a known alert. Um, and unfortunately, when there's high CPU throttling, it's not always immediately obvious how you fix that. You could fix that in multiple ways. Maybe the issue is that your um, pod has an incorrect uh, CPU request. Maybe the issue is that you uh, have a CPU limit, which is configured to rock. Maybe the issue really is that you don't have enough CPU and you need to add on more CPU. Maybe there's something else um, it, on the pod that's interfering and you define things wrong. So there are a lot of different reasons why that could happen. And essentially the enricher, the automation for this specific alert, it runs in the decision tree and it figures out why that there is occurring. Moving on to the next example, um, it, let's say you have a memory leak and your pod gets unkilled. Um, it, now, if you have a memory leak, your pod gets unkilled, it's gonna come back up, it's gonna get killed again a few minutes later. Um, and that's really inconvenient. Um, or it'll get killed an hour later, it depends on how fast you're leaking memory. And the obvious thing that you're going to want to know is you're going to want to know, um, it, well, like, why is this pod leaking memory? Um, it, so what you would do normally if you were running like code on a normal server back in the old day, then you would like SSH into that server and then you would run like JMAP or JSTAC or you would run a, like a debugging tool and you would grab a memory dump of that and then you would see like what's using up the memory and you could do two differential ones like 10 minutes apart and see what's allocated but not free. So we actually have a lot of stuff built into Robusta. But let's do that. That's just one more automated action. So there's an automated action to grab a memory dump um, from a Java application. There's one to grab a memory dump from a Python application. Um, so here's an example with Java. And here's an example where you can see where are the top objects that were allocated um, in that application. And you can run this automatically um, every time, for example, that your pod is about to be umkilt. So that's a really cool thing that you can do. And then you get a message in Slack with the data. Now I see that there's um, another question here. Can we also configure an event with uh, this specific dog, an event for the specific dog stream generated with any pod as well with Robusta? For example, a pod is running, but would be interested in a specific keyword error code generated by the application. Yes, you can. There are two ways you can do this. The first way is you can just uh, define um, with Elasticsearch. If you're using Elasticsearch, you can define an Elasticsearch monitor. And Robust has built-in support for triggering these with Elasticsearch monitors. So that's one way. And the second way, it's not in general, it's not in GA yet, so it's in beta. And um, I don't know if we have it public in our GitHub repository, but please message me if you need it. Um, you can actually uh, use built-in functionality in Robusta itself, um, and then you can add on the trigger within Robusta, needed to Robusta for a specific keyword. 
Um, I don't believe that's in GA yet. So if you want that, then message me. And I'd love to have you beta test that. Moving on to another example, then we're going to look at another known alert that you can um, automatically investigate with Robusta. And again, value is included. So you just install Robusta, send your Prometheus alerts. This will all happen out of the box. You don't need to configure anything. Um, but you can also write your own, of course, for your own alerts. Um, so let's say you have uh, the common Prometheus alert node file system space filling up. In other words, you're getting low on disk space on the node. Then by default, we will run um, an automated workflow to investigate that. And it will tell you what pods are using the space, tell you how much disk space is being used, how much is being used by the pods, how much is being used by the node itself, by the host. Um, so just another example of how you can automatically investigate known alerts. Um, moving on to the next topic, you can also use Robusta for remediations. So let's say you're auto scaling and your auto skater reached the maximum number of replicas and you're like, it's 3 a.m. and there's lots of load on your servers and you just want to go back to sleep and like do a proper fix in the morning. So you can get an alert in stack that says, okay, you reached the maximum for the HPAs. Would you like to up it by 30%? There's just a button there in stack and you push that button, it does an automatic remediation. Um, you can run these remediations automatically entirely without even asking you in stack. We typically recommend that you do like ask the person in Slack that they confirm, but you can also do it entirely automatic. Uh, moving on, and here's another example. This one isn't quite alert response, but it also really helps with investigating stuff. We have a lot of features in Robusta around change tracking. So you can kick off these automated workflows, not just when there's an alert, but also for any change that happens within the Kubernetes cluster. So for example, uh, here I've set up an automated workflow so that every time that you deploy a new version of your application, then we're going to your Grafana and we're adding there an annotation. That's the style line. And we're showing you at this exact point in time, a new version of your application was deployed. And that's really useful because then you can see a correlation between issues that occur, like CPU going up in between new deployments. And to configure that, I'll show you the YAML for that. So here the trigger is just on deployment update. So when you update a deployment and the action is um, add deployment lines to Grafana. It's an action that will go to Grafana and add deployment lines, and you specify here which dashboard uh, and the API key. So you can really see here the power of this as general purpose automation engine, but one that's really, really dedicated to um, alerting uh, use cases. And the last topic I want to speak about is, OK, like what's going on under the hood? Like It's great that I showed you can fetch the dogs, and you can like add an annotation to Grafana, and you can do all these things. What if you want to do something? that isn't one of our 70 built-in actions. So it's really easy to write your own actions. You just do it in Python. Under the hood, everything is just Python functions. So here's an example for the logs in Richer that you saw earlier. It's just a Python function. And um, here, you get this event. That's the event that you get from the trigger. So you get the data with the pod. It's a pod event. Um, in Python, you can say like event that get pod. Here you have the pod. And you call a function like pod that get logs. Um, and we have a rich Python API. It's ultimately based around the, uh, the Python, uh, the Kubernetes API client in Python with some higher level stuff. Uh, but we make it really easy now to write these own actions yourself. So you can easily add on your own stuff. I know, for example, um, I believe the guys uh, from White Hat Junior have written a bunch of actions internally to uh, restart deployments under certain situations where they're unhealthy. Um, I know um, there are a bunch of other cases uh, where other companies have gone and written their own actions and open up PRs for Robusta too to add those back to Robusta. Um, so we're seeing a lot of uh, interest really in a lot of people writing their own actions around this, um, especially at larger companies. Okay, so that's it. I'll pause here for any more questions. And um, I also wanna say, um, I really love hearing from people. So if you're listening to this talk and you liked it, or if you didn't like it, then please reach out and let me know what you liked or you didn't like. I really love to hear people. It's the most satisfying thing about talking. And um, I'm very active on Twitter and LinkedIn. So please add me on add me on LinkedIn. Um, I approve everyone. Uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter. And please reach out. I'd love to hear from people. And if there are any questions, then I'll stop here. Hey, Nathan. Um, that was really a, an insightful session. It's really informative. And uh, uh, I think. Um, most of the crowd liked your uh, PPTs, very colorful and very engaging. And I think people have already visited Augusta.dev and they're liking the UI as well. I think uh, you've got a compliment saying it's aesthetically really good from Shakai Barif. 
thanks yeah. a lot and thanks for uh, being open to accept the invitations on linkedin and twitter i think that will be really be really helpful for people who would like to really collaborate with you and maybe yeah work with you yeah. at all yep if, if i have another 30 seconds maybe i'll just show Sha- shakaib what it actually looks like with the sides uh-huh. um do we have time for that uh yeah how much time is going to take uh, natan 10 seconds no sure go ahead please yeah i'll just show it cuz i know people um like it so it's really easy to do these slides like i'm using the pro version of canva and they don't pay me or anything i actually pay them <laughs> but you can go in here and i can like search for uh sleep mm-hmm. uh, it's doing that in hebrew uh, i can search in here for like sleep and then they'll find me like graphics of people sleeping and i can put those in so that's really nice and it's easy to use so i recommend people do that um cool cool yeah so i'm pretty sure people are going to have some questions if there are any questions i think natan is going to be available on slack channel for uh, uh for the answers so yeah thanks thanks a lot uh, natan and um, it was It's really been an absolute pleasure and thank you for having me <laughs> thanks 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 a lot bye